Border sessions in The Hague, uh, a two-day event uh, where well, people uh, give inspiring uh, talks, uh, nice discussions, etc. from all sorts of uh, fields. Uh, Jonathan Morgan, uh, there are arts people here, there are science people here, there are data people here. I think you are a, a data man, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd like to think of myself as, as an, a, artist, in as data. an artist as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've still yeah. got the, the creative spirit inside. Yeah. Um, but actually, I mean, that's that's kind of what I was talking about uh, at the at the festival is that there's a real like separation between these two things in most people's mind. There's like a, oh, data, like it exists over here and I interact with it in kind of a boring, like uh, only in an intellectual academic way. And that really what we should be doing is, as technology people is building environments where people can be creative and be expressive in interacting with information just like they are when they interact with uh, you know a, a musical instrument and composing a song you should be able to compose ideas with uh, with information in the same way so that's really what I'm advocating for us to do better yeah. as, uh, as data people to be more creative you know? so so yes to be more inclusive yeah absolutely yeah, yeah so that uh, because there really is some value for everybody um, when we stop thinking about like oh well only data scientists can work with data and then we hand down answers to everybody else as if we're like some oracle or something it just doesn't it's not uh, it's not I don't think it's the best way to do it no yeah. so, uh, so 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 is there still a lot to be done when we talk about democratization of data yeah yeah and not, not even so much the the data itself I mean I think We've taken a good first step in a lot of places, like many organizations are working on opening data and making it more available. Um, people have a, a lot more awareness now about how their data is being used and governments are opening up data, but we still don't, like getting knowledge out of that, like sort of getting value out of it, or like when people actually have some kind of emotional meaning that they get out of this data that we keep making available, yeah. like that's where there's still a gap. And that's that's not democratized at all right now. That's still only accessible to you know a very, very small percentage of the population. Yeah. And I think it's because we're not building technologies and systems that let people get that kind of emotional response out of data without um, without without lots of boring years of training. Yeah, yeah. I sometimes <laughs> tell people. So I, I have a, I'm a journalist and I have a music yeah. background. I sometimes I tell, say to people in, in in a couple of phases, uh, technology uh, or, or due to new technology, I, I I was more independent of other people. For example, I was one of the first radio makers to start using uh, Pro Tools, the digital uh -huh. uh, editing uh, yeah, environment. Yeah. So I didn't need the guy in the studio anymore. I could do it myself. Uh -huh. Uh, the same thing happened later on with video, of course, when mm -hmm. I, I could edit it, uh, stuff myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then with small websites, but sometimes I have the impression that we're in a phase again where I need more uh, technical people again to do the stuff, uh, uh, to the stuff I want. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so how can you, how can we make this? Uh, uh, well, available for me as, uh, again as well. Oh yeah, I think that's actually a really good way to think about it. It's sort of we are maybe at the beginning stage of a of a new type of technology, and that it's just it's only a matter of time before we kind of figure out how to make the ways of interacting with that technology um, intuitive enough that people who don't maybe understand who maybe would have been uncomfortable with like a huge sound desk when they went to like editing that and capturing the sound is actually it seems very complicated but with Pro Tools it's oh I kind of see how things work and yeah. it's intuitive and you can explore it and you can kind of teach yourself and challenge yourself and be creative I think that we're just moving the uh, kind of hiding more and more of that complexity in something that is intuitive for people to interact with so it feels more like the way they interact with everything else yeah. and I, uh, I mean cartography used to be something that was a specialist discipline that only a few academics could achieve but now we have Google Maps on our phone that tells us like turn by turn exactly how to navigate into a city we've never been to before so I think that it's that kind of um, almost like it's, the, it's building intuitive systems for interacting with the information. So the complexity kind of falls away and we don't see it anymore. Yeah, um, so, so what do you do in your, in your daily life? Uh, well, we're trying to build this kind of system. Uh, so on the one hand, um, we're trying to build new ways of thinking about information and teaching machines to understand data in a way that has more context and has like more um, helps real world people to understand how that context in the real world and interact with data in an emotional way. Um, so we're building those sorts of technologies. And then also we're applying that hopefully to solving interesting social problems. So we're researching why people behave the way that they do um, and how they communicate and, and things like that. 
this to hopefully not only make data more accessible and the technologies more accessible, but then also make sure that we're focused on um, understanding problems that are just important to all of us as a society. Are, are we are we too much in a phase where it seems to uh, uh, there this, this seem to be that? Uh, gathering the data is one thing, but making sense of the data is a completely different thing, of course. Are yeah. we still too much in the phase of, of gathering? Yeah, in fact, I think that might even be if there was like one theme for the past 10 years, it's like we built a lot of really good plumbing for data. You know, like we know how to capture it, and we know how to store it, and we know how to move it, and yeah. we talk about the size of it all the time. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but yeah, I agree that um, it, the we've sort of assumed that, well, the only reason, the only way that you would get any knowledge out of that is if you had a human being assert their knowledge and creativity over that data, as opposed to building technologies and systems that let us kind of do that in a more automated way. So I agree with you. That's kind of like, I hate to use the expression sense making because yeah. I feel like it's a little bit, uh, but, okay. uh, but I do think that part of it, making sense of data is, uh, is the most exciting part of where the technology is going. Yeah. For sure. So, what are the biggest hurdles for you to to to, to, to take uh, when you're when you're doing this? Um, well, part of it is that um, it's uh, it's actually because the data can be about anything. Um, it's so the the way that we talk about it is sort of like the way that a video game designer might build an entire world and the way that you interact with that world is very constrained. Maybe you tap on a button on a joystick or move it around, and that action in real life is meaningless, but because we can interpret it in this world in which we're omnipotent and omniscient, then we can say, oh, you didn't mean forward tap, you meant kill the ogre by jumping over the fence, right? Like, yeah. that's quite cool. Um, and then on the data side, I think we can create worlds in a similar way, very complex, rich, full of context, like full of feeling, so that the actions that we take in interacting with the data are equally as meaningful and feel as thrilling as killing the ogre. The difficult part is that that data already exists, so we have to build a world around something that we've never seen before. We don't have total control in the way that a video game designer would. Yeah. So that's, I think, where a lot, it, it, almost like we have to derive the world from the information, which is where I think most of the complexity is. But yeah. we're figuring it out. We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, according to the uh, website of Border Sessions, some of the things you have been doing is uh, identifying uh, ISIS, ISIS supporters on Twitter, using machine learning, um, uh, uh, quantifying chemical weapons attacks in, in, in Syria. Um, can you explain? Can you can you explain an example like this? Sure. What do you do? How do you do it? And how does uh, the technology help you? There? Sure. So, I mean, the the uh, discovering like groups of ISIS supporters on Twitter is a is an is a nice example, right? Because the techniques that we used are are fairly common kind of social media like analytics tools in the same way that a big brand like Coca-Cola yeah. might decide who are the people online who are talking about Coca-Cola and really love our product. Mm -hmm. And they want to find out who those people are so that they can engage with them and help sell more of their product. Yeah. In a very similar way, we can look at the way that people talk about any other kind of identity with which they identify for one reason or another. Um, and so based on your behavior online, we could probably figure out if you like Coca-Cola, that's not so interesting, but we can also figure out whether or not you really like the idea of extremism and violence, which um, is, a, is a way that we can say, here are some people who are either in this group or are nearby this group, kind of online, almost like in the surface yeah, or, or of the or network. Or post potentially moving towards. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that might be an area where we might want to say, well, let's let's see if we can have a conversation with these people um, who are maybe vulnerable to this this kind of dangerous um, ideology and, and, and hopefully, um, well, stop them from traveling to a part of the world where they could actually engage in real conflicts, not yeah. just words, and maybe actually have a conversation where they don't feel compelled to spread kind of hateful messages in communities that affect other people. So that's and the, the so I think the actual like technologies are well established, and it's mostly just thinking about applying them on the right sorts of problems that um, that problems that are meaningful and problems that help us um, hopefully change the way that we behave and interact with each other. Yeah. Um, so for who. Have you been doing this? Is it for the, for the police, for the government, for the, uh, or is this just a case that you want to prove that it's possible? Um, so the, the, the work w about ISIS we actually did for um, a think tank in the United States called the Brookings Institution. Um, and so they do a lot of um, kind of analysis about both uh, kind of conflict and political actors. They also do analysis of economies and education systems. So they, they're a research organization. Mm -hmm. um, the work for um, where we were trying to identify 
uh, chemical weapons attacks in Syria. That was with um, a nonprofit, kind of an NGO, a technology NGO. And then we were working with a, a guy called Elliot Higgins, who runs a website called Bellingcat. Yeah. And he's a big fan of like um, using open information yeah. to uh, kind of understand conflict in an open information. It's really way. impressive, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, super, uh, cool. uh, super cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I the, what, what I really like is, is the fields, and I think this is a really good example of it, of where you, of course, have the combination of the power of uh, the technology, the, other, the, the, the computer, and, 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 and humans, the person doing it. And this is a really good example of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, in fact, like, and it's the nice thing where it's like we, we can create technologies to allow people to collaborate, to, um, to discover interesting and potentially meaningful things. I mean, I think that like, the work that Elliot does is a really good example where um, it's not there. He's actually focused on it less from a technology perspective and more from a collaboration perspective where they'll, they'll use kind of straightforward or like reporting techniques that are just a lot of work. <laughs> like, yeah, it takes yeah. a lot of time to do them. But when you separate that work up amongst a group of people, it becomes possible to do kind of complex things. Um, and we feel kind of the same way about technology that each individual action it, and, and each little piece of data, well, it's not that complex, it's not that hard, it just takes a little bit of work, but composing them together into a system that allows you to get real knowledge, well, that's pretty complex. Yeah. And so that's the sort of thing that we hope that we can yeah. orchestrate. Yeah, you mentioned earlier uh, Google Maps and that we have that uh, in, in, in the palm of our hands. Uh, uh, Waze, of course, is, uh, is, is part of Google uh, mm -hmm. uh, now. Yeah, yeah. And that, that combination of um, uh, well, the collaboration and, and, uh, and the computer power as well, we, we, yeah. where we in our cars help uh, well, getting the most actual information and... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great example. Hopefully not getting into a car accident while we're like, you know... <laughs> while we're other well, they know. always ask you, of course, yeah. that's, that, so they have, have got that covered, because they always <laughs> ask you, when, hey, are you the driver or are you the, uh, the guy sitting? Of course, then you can lie as uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually my favorite feature on Snapchat. If you've ever used that, uh, you yeah. can... Um, one of the things is you're posting a photo of yourself on Snapchat or whatever, you can, um, it, it will read how quickly you're moving. And so you can post the speed at which you're moving with your, with your photo. And there's a big message that says, hey, don't use this while you're driving. Really? It's like, well, when else would I use that? Yeah, yeah. Like, so it's yeah. pretty funny. Um, you, uh, I, I saw you saying somewhere that, um, um, of course, the, the, that, you uh, you call it a data coup, I think, uh, that a lot of our data uh, mm -hmm. is, is now in the hands of only a, a, a couple of large uh, companies. Mm. Uh, but they are all good companies, aren't they? They, have, they're, they're, <laughs> they don't do anything bad with the data. So. Right, of course not, of course not. I mean, and I think, I think we could probably argue at the moment that they're on the whole not yet doing anything that bad with our data. However, um, I don't know that we can trust companies to behave in the interest of the public. That's not really what companies are designed to do. That would be, it, it would just be, it's almost like it doesn't make any sense to ask that of a company. That's not what they're there for. Maybe you could argue that that's what governments are for, but even then, like, yeah. the anywhere where there's a big consolidation of power, you maybe don't want them to have total control over your information. Mm -hmm. um, but I would argue that the even outside of the fact that there are certain large entities that have a lot of our information, there's a really small number of individuals who have kind of power over the knowledge that we can get out of that information. So unless you are, um, like we don't build systems to allow people to get knowledge out of their data, we say that, well, only we need to ask the data scientists. So whenever you want to know something, something that's meaningful to you, that question has to be interpreted by somebody who is a data scientist, and then yeah. that person gives you an answer that, well, they feel is appropriate for you. Yeah. And I think that that gatekeeper, although I, I would, I mean, I, I don't feel as if all of the data scientists in the world are nefarious, um, but I do think that any time you have that consolidation of power, we're at risk for, um, well, you just, you, I think we run, we run the risk of there being a big divide in the accessibility to knowledge, mm -hmm. and I think that that is always a problem. It's always a situation that leads to instability. It's always a situation that leads to inequality. And it's something that I just, it, 
we're in just the beginning of it and I don't think we should let it continue. No, because first we had, of course, uh, the internet. One of the things the internet helped us with is um, um, the democratization, publishing and communication, etc. Yeah. So it, it, feel, it, it felt like, hey, this is a level playing field. We can all have our say in all our stuff. Yeah. I sometimes have the idea that we are at the moment at a stage where, there's a, like, like you say, there's a big gap again t t t between well people maybe like yourself and you're, you're a good guy of course but uh, yeah. I, I very often have the idea is um, um, uh, well I need more technology than I used to uh, mm -hmm. so, so is it but is it a problem or yeah that's yeah I mean I, I, I personally I, I do think even if at the moment we don't recognize it as being a problem it's only a matter of time and I think that it's a it's a really good analogy to talk about the sort of beginnings of the internet when we could start to po and not even so much the technology itself but when a large enough number of people started to use the internet that it became an attractive publishing platform um, and that it was one that didn't have any kind of gatekeeper to it yeah. uh, and it is that that kind of change that like disruption of the way that we behave as a society and share information as a society I think is um, is coming in in data science and i would like to be at the beginning of it you know, okay <laughs> yeah. okay thanks a lot and we'll follow you um with with the things you're doing uh, and uh you said you're from uh, you didn't say it in the interview here but you said it before you're from austin so i will see you there uh, next march sounds good we'll see you at south by southwest <laughs> yeah uh, thanks a lot for watching we will do um, one more interview at uh, five o'clock here the last interview from the border sessions uh, in the hague hope to see you then